那个我们在这个出发过程当中呢，这个大家应该会更多的这个珍惜机会，珍惜机会。因为我们今年就是发生了很多事情。Maybe because many things had happened this year, many people indeed felt that it is very difficult to encounter the Dharma, very difficult to obtain human body, very difficult to meet a genuine spiritual teacher, and very difficult to study the Mahayana Dharma. And through this process of understanding it, wherever you are, in fact, since you are already on the path of、uh, the Dharma of practice, you should cherish this opportunity. And maybe you have this opportunity now, this year, but you would never know if you still have such opportunities next year. Back in 2018, 2019, I've already made this point very clearly. There are people who would say that it's my clairvoyance, or I made such predictions, which then turn out to be true. But I think, from the point of view of Buddhist logic, it is mere inference based on the cause and conditions、um, that led to such kind of creation. I think many people nowadays have felt that it's very difficult to listen to the Dharma. Um, at the end of last year, I gave teaching on Uttara Tantra Shastra as well as the Shrangama Sutra.、Uh, but、uh, later, the live broadcastings were put to a stop, and、uh, I came back to Larangar on the seventh of December. I gave teaching on the thirty-seven verses of Bodhisattva、uh, between the tenth to the thirteenth, and then give the teachings on Confession Liturgy of thirty-five Buddhas. Uh, on the 15th and、uh, 17th. But between then and now, there were no classes, mainly because of the breakout of COVID-19. Many people were under break,、uh, under uh, the lockdown, and、uh, the practitioners took the opportunity to practice in retreat in their little dark room, and they had a good time. But for people who are non-practitioners, they probably didn't have that great of a time. So, for various reasons, we are restarting the classes again today, and、uh, through. We've、uh, been through so much for the first half a year, and you should probably understand it is very difficult to under to learn the Dharma. The supreme, profound, and sublime Dharma is difficult to meet, even in a billion eons. But now I have been fortunate enough to have seen it, heard it, received it, and keep it. I vow to attain the true meaning of the Tathagata. In order to benefit all sentient beings, let's generate、uh, the supreme bodhicitta. Today, our class is on transforming suffering and happiness into enlightenment.、Uh, I can't quite remember if I've received the oral transmission in the Tibetan language, but、uh, maybe I will inquire it and give it to you guys after.、Um, today, I'm just going to give you the teaching. This text has three aspects: the beginning virtue of an,、uh, initial in statement, and the middle virtue of actual text, and virtue of concluding statement. The beginning virtue also has three aspects: the first is the text, the title of the text, and then the homage, and the third point is the statement of intent. So let's talk about the title first. The title, "Transforming Suffering and Happiness into Enlightenment," in fact, is the core of this profound text. What does it mean? I think all of you know, in our world, in、uh, the practice, happiness and suffering. In fact, accompanies everyone throughout the whole life. There is no one who had never experienced suffering, nor anyone who had never experienced any little bit of happiness. None of anyone would experience the extremes of either. So we can say that, in fact, in our life, it is the intertwined、uh, happiness and suffering that occurs in our life. 
alternate、uh, alternately. Sometimes we have more happiness, and sometimes we have more suffering. And as mundane being, majority of people would think that happy、uh, suffering is something that we're trying to avoid, and happiness is something that we're trying to pursue. That is our sole goal、uh, to pursue in this life. And because of such kind of mentality, the majority of people are so much going after the happiness, and so very much afraid of encountering any kind of、uh, suffering. To pursue happiness and avoid suffering, in fact, is so embedded in us. It's so habitually embedded in us that we can probably see that experience in our daily life as well. But as exper as a practitioner, when suffering is、uh, when there is suffering in life,、uh, as a practitioner, you won't feel so afraid because. He can definitely turn or transform that onto the path of enlightenment, and same as happiness. People would probably question, "Well, I understand why to transform suffering, but why do you need to transform happiness onto the path of enlightenment? Happiness is something that we all pursue, isn't it? It's something that is so joyful, and we enjoy it. Why do we need to transform it and turn it?" In fact, both suffering and happiness need to be transformed onto the path of enlightenment. Why is that? Because when mundane beings encounter suffering, they would be extremely saddened and、um, depressed and cannot accept it and feel extremely,、um, extremely upset. And there's lots of anxiety and lots of frustration, lots of、uh, fragility. Many of those negative emotions would occur, and in such a way, in fact, that person's life. Uh, can be completely destructed. However, after encountering happiness, isn't that good? Why can't a person accept happiness? In fact, for mundane beings, happiness is very difficult to enjoy as well. Because when someone has happiness, it's very easy for that person to also、uh, generate the air,、uh, the mind of arrogance and generate some condescence、uh, towards others. For people with lots of merit, maybe during happiness,、um, that person can enjoy it more. But there are people who can't really enjoy much of the happiness because of a lack of virtue. Just as in the Chinese idiom, it says that great virtue would promote great prosperity. So, if someone who has great virtue and、uh, integrity, that would promote prosperity or wealth and fame. But without the great virtue, without a great integrity,、um, even if the person gets lots of money, that person cannot be happy either. Many people would say that I don't have money, but if I do, I would definitely be happy. I'll be very successful. That's well not necessarily true, because without virtue, even if you have lots of money, that could only become the cause for suffering, and then、um, multiply into more suffering and eventually destruct your life. So, from the glance, from a glance, we can see that people would love to enjoy happiness, and people cannot enjoy suffering, cannot accept suffering at all. But after analysis, we will be able to. Figure out that not only we need to transform suffering, we need to transform happiness onto the path of enlightenment as well. Because without such kind of transformation、um, to the path of enlightenment, then the happiness and the suffering can be a cause of destruction to your life. It can be an unfavorable condition for your life. So through practice, we need to transform it, all of those、uh, into favorable conditions. There are lots of practitioners who would enjoy happiness and not 
go into half arrogance or a condescension, a sense of condescension when looking at other people who are suffering, and they would rather share such kind of happiness with other sentient beings. And then this kind of happiness would become a favorable, favorable condition to、uh, onto the path of、uh, enlightenment. At the meantime, enjoying such happiness won't be a cause of uh, 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 of losing one's virtue. Normally, I think people have、uh, the strength to work with suffering and uh, uh, and obstacles, but it's difficult for them to work with happiness or to live with happiness. In special times, in very difficult、uh, adversity, they would practice diligently. But when they have more fame and more wealth, their practice would actually retrogress. We can see that from. Uh, fellow practitioners around us. In fact,、uh, some of them maybe at the beginning of their practice don't really have lots of、uh, wealth or belongings,、um, but then、uh, and then they would practice very diligently. But later,、uh, they get more famous and well known and、uh, receive more financial supports from others. And maybe because of the lack of merit and many other reasons,、um, then they would lose their、uh, practice as well as virtue. We can see such kind of examples in our lives very often. So that is why we need to transform happiness or favorable conditions onto the path of enlightenment as well. And it is also necessary to transform suffering onto the path of practice, because within samsara. In fact, we have more suffering than happiness in our life, with or without noticing it. There's so many different kinds of sufferings around us, entangling us,、uh, such as、uh, the suffering, suffering, suffering of change, and so on. If you do not transform these kind of sufferings onto the path of practice, then your practice cannot、uh, succeed. It cannot come to a successful fruition. There is no one that can go through a life, can go through practice without any obstacles, without any pain or suffering. There is no one、uh, like that. We can see from the previous masters'、uh, biographies, and we can read through their stories and、uh, see that, in fact, all the great masters endured so much more suffering and pain than the mundane people. In fact, if they don't have a way to transform suffering onto the path of practice, it would be very difficult for them to endure all of the suffering. How to transform it then? You definitely need to practice it because you cannot rely on、um, the soul theory. You cannot rely on your social status or your wealth. Their people may think that, well, maybe I should just get ordained and become a monk or nun, and in such a way I won't have any suffering at all. That's not necessarily true, because after you shave off your hair, you throw away your rings and、uh, ornaments and all your different ornaments and accessories a mile away, and、uh, give up your lover and your、um, relative, your families. But if you don't practice, you will still suffer. You still suffer. You suffer well, bald, and you'll be crying like that every day as well. Even if you get ordained in such a way without practice, so. So if you do not、um, actually adapt the Mahayana teaching into your own、uh, mind stream, you、uh, all of these would be useless. But if you can、um, practice the Mahayana Dharma and、uh, Uh, and really fuse it into your own mind stream. Even if you don't shave off your hair, there's no change outside externally.、Um, in fact, whatever things you encounter can be transformed onto the path. Mahayana is in fact quite supreme. Without practice, whatever 
titles you have, Kenpo's, uh, Kenpo's, Sengeshi, Sengeshima's, uh, Dharma teachers, whatever kind of lay practitioners, uh, the lay practitioners received uh, Bodhisattva vow, received so and so empowerments, um, and have so many heads of uh, the gurus on your neck, or actually wearing the pendants of the heads of the the of the teachers on your neck and uh, holding different kinds of um, the uh, the instruments the dharma instruments doesn't matter whatever kind of titles and what kind of uh, things you have if your mind is uh, not aligned with the dharma even if you wear the skulls just like um, uh, just like Yamataka, it doesn't it, it doesn't really make much of a difference. So to put these teachings into practice is extremely important. If you if you can really practice it, even if you encounter some of the suffering that is so difficult to endure in the worldly sense you will be able to transform it very easily. And that is the method of transform happiness and suffering onto the path of enlightenment. And I think this teaching is very necessary to many people. We definitely need it too. And this kind of pith instruction can, and this kind of pith instruction can definitely ease our entanglement, our, uh, the different kinds kinds of afflictions that um, uh, then bonds us and could definitely help in such a way. So this is very important for a practitioner. And now um, we're going to talk about how to transform both suffering and happiness into enlightenment. And uh, I will talk about it in this two aspect. In fact, I don't really have, I don't really know how long I'm going to teach this. So we'll see how many classes we need to finish this teaching. And I am under no pressure. In fact, this world is is ever changing, same as samsara, many things could change. And um, after all of these kind of changes, I think lots of the things that's hidden, maybe for some people who may get enlightened but not yet there, uh, on the brink of it, maybe because of uh, some of the external conditions that is happening nowadays, uh, some of the innermost secrets, uh, secrets which naturally unveil itself, and maybe that, that could be a very good condition, very favorable condition for those of you. So that is how practitioners can have a very different way of thinking than the mundane people. The mundane people would dwell in happiness. They grasp onto happiness. They don't want to leave happiness as, uh, at all for an instant. In the morning when they wake up, if they had a really good sleep, they would feel like, I don't want to get up. They would keep snoozing their alarm clock. And they just want to sleep more because it feels so comfortable. And they would dwell in it. But practitioners not only know how to transform happiness onto the path, and most importantly, whenever there is something that's very difficult to endure in their life that happens, whatever suffering continues to happen, such as death of parents and slander from others, the continuous suffering just constantly going on. But if you have a very steady mind, then you can call yourself a genuine practitioner. So that's the title. Today, I probably won't talk too much about it. And that was the title. And now the author, the author of this text is uh, Dujumchen Jigme Tempanima. The first uh, Dujum Rinpoche had eight uh, Dharma heirs. And I think Tempanima, that is uh, Dujumchen, in fact, is the eldest. And out of the eight, 
uh, in there's um, uh, also uh, Sarah Kondro's husband and a few others. He has a few of excellent uh, texts written, uh, such as outline commentary on Gyuha Garba Tantra. I, I, I wanted to give teaching on it. There were people who translated it already, but I never really had an opportunity. And uh, there are some of the Terma text teachings. Um, some. Uh, some of the Western universities, uh, in fact, I've given the teachings in some of those universities. He was born in 1865 and died in the year 1926 and lived for 62 years. His name appeared in the biography of Mipar Rinpoche. He is one of the most important and most helpful disciple of uh, uh, Mipar Rinpoche, a very great disciple. And um, Ponsok Rinpoche once said, uh, Ponsok Rinpoche once taught that there was once, um, Patru Rinpoche said that the teaching of Nima is quite hopeful. Why is that? Because uh, Tempe, Tempe Nima uh, give teaching of um, of uh, the way of the Bodhisattva at the age of eight, which then signifies the accomplishment of teaching, and then um, the and then another uh, teacher, Pamadudum from Nyaro, attained rainbow body in one uh, in this lifetime, which then signified the prosperity of uh, uh, of realization of the Dharma. So many, uh, many great masters give great praise to this author, um, and uh, I've read lots of his dohas. His dohas or vajra songs, compared to um, compared to Mipar and Buche and so on, I think it's rather a bit difficult to understand in terms of uh, the wording. And uh, uh, compared to the other dohas, I think this particular text that is transforming suffering and happiness into enlightenment is easier to understand. Anyhow, uh, this author is in fact a very famous, many great masters uh, abroad or domestically really likes his teachings in terms of esoteric, exoteric. Um, teachings and uh, as well as his dohas and uh, his commentaries and so on. I, I believe there's a, a publication from the Tibetan publication. There are about six or seven volumes. Then the translator. The translator is me. Uh, I translated. It. I started translating it on. 20, on the 21st of uh, February this year, when it was in fact the most severe of the pandemic, I finished translating on 5th of March when it was when everyone was really anxious, and I exactly used that situation and transformed the happiness and suffering uh, into the path of practice. And I then uh, was um, in retreat and I stayed indoor. It was really great. The day I finished translating, the death toll in China has already rose to 3,000. People were very anxious, very stressed, and I translated it in such kind of uh, 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 um, such kind of social background, and I also uh, did a little bit uh, editing and so on. So that's uh, that's the whole background of translation. So now let's look at the homage. Homage. I pay homage to noble Avalokiteshvara, recalling his qualities. The um, the later part is a little bit different, so the Chinese translation may be a little bit different. Um, forever youthful, forever joyful at the happiness of others and plunged into sorrow whenever they suffer. You have fully realized a great compassion with all its qualities and abide without a care for your own happiness or suffering. Why Avalokiteshvara? Because Avalokiteshvara all, always uh, practice the um, uh, uh, always practice transforming um, the uh, the Tonglen practice. So uh, that is the, the Bodhisattva 
of great compassion. And to such a bodhisattva, uh, the author pays its homage. And this kind of, to this kind of a bodhisattva who practice by transform, uh, transform or have this uh, heart of uh, practicing Tonglen, the author pays homage. The reason of paying homage to Avalokiteshvara is because also um, he sees the happiness of sentient beings and feel happy for them and uh, uh, feels saddened when sees the suffering of sentient beings. And that is the characteristic or the merit of the great compassionate Avalokiteshvara. In the nature of Avalokiteshvara, he has already eradicated all the uh, solid suffering and happiness and abide in such kind of a state, and that is very differ different than those of the mundane beings. The mundane beings would grasp on to happiness and uh, uh, feel really suffered when there's uh, pain and uh, obstacles, but when others encounter it, they don't really feel it at, at, at all. In the Vimalakirti Sutra, we learned that when mundane beings see other people happy, they feel um, they feel upset, and when they see other people suffer, they would feel happy. And that is, in fact, exact opposite of the bodhisattvas. The mundane beings would rather to gain happiness for themselves. They don't want suffering for themselves at all. But when it is for the other sentient beings, um, it is exactly different. When they see other sentient beings suffering, the mundane beings would feel very happy about it. Uh, for example, during the pandemic, let it be other countries, other ethnic, if there are lots of death toll and when others are encountering lots of suffering, there are people who take delights in others' misfortune. They feel that they've earned it. In fact, that's how majority of mundane beings feel. That's the mentality of it. And it's a common mentality. But a bodhisattva is not a common mundane being. The bodhisattvas don't want others to suffer, even if they cannot ha uh, benefit or help them. They would rather to wish other people to be happy. So that is why the author first pay homage to Avalokiteshvara first, because Avalokiteshvara already attained equanimity, or even uh, uh, or even um, taking others before themselves. So to this kind of realization, uh, the author then prays and uh, pays homage. If bodhisattvas are exactly like us, who who feels upset when suff when during suffering, who uh, feels uh, who uh, look at other people's suffering and take delight in it, and then that then that kind of quality uh, don't really worth any ho homage at all. We need to pay homage or prostrate to the ones who, who have certain merits. In fact, uh, Avalokiteshvara's merit has already surpassed us from all different ways. Um, unlike Mandembi, would feel afraid to uh, to would would pay homage or would honor the their leaders or their supervisors due to fear. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Avalokiteshvara uh, surpassed us in so many different ways. Therefore, it is natural that we would pay homage to him because of his virtue and because of his merit. And while you're doing this homage, while you're prostrating to that quality, you should also think about how Avalokiteshvara is such a great bodhisattva, and may I please also attain the same merit to benefit sentient beings. And may I also attain such kind of uh, uh, realization so that I can benefit sentient beings and share the happiness to all sentient beings uh, so that 
at least eventually I'll be able to uh, attain the same um, enlightenment as Avalokiteshvara. So while you recite this uh, this homage, you should think in such a way. In one hand, you should recite it and reciting as a homage, and uh, in your mind, you should you should also think about how great uh, Avalokiteshvara is, and I should uh, uh, prostrate and pay homage, and this is uh, paying homage uh, uh, in the mind, and then uh, in terms of body, you can uh, you can uh, visualize or you can prostrate. That's also another way of paying homage. This is how we follow the previous great masters and great practitioners and pay homage in the same way and eventually uh, we will be able to gain such a kind of merit uh, both in the worldly and uh, 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 relative and ultimate way we should practice in such a way and the third aspect we're going to talk about is the statement of intent uh, intention so the intention is that I'm going to put down here a partial instruction on how to use both happiness and the suffering as the path of enlightenment. This is extremely necessary. This practice is uh, necessary and uh, this practice is indispensable for the leading for leading a spiritual life a most needed tool of the noble ones and quite the most priceless teaching in the world this thin uh, pamphlet of teachings in fact is priceless you cannot price it you cannot give it a price tag because the instruction of practice is indeed very uh, is indeed uh, uh, very precious and uh, can uh, can be very difficult to obtain. So there are two ways or two aspects of the statement of intent. And the first one is transform happiness, uh, transform suffering. The second one is transform happiness uh, into the path of enlightenment. It has the content, the value. It is indispensable for the practitioners. Many people would call themselves practitioners. But can you actually transform suffering onto the path of uh, practice when there is suffering? Can you transform happiness onto the path of enlightenment? If you are a good practitioner, or if you're very keen in terms of theory, then you can transform suffering and happiness into enlightenment. But if you're not, it doesn't matter how long you spend in studying the Dharma or stayed in a certain place for so many years, it, it's not really a sign of succeeding practice uh, if you cannot transform any of those into uh, onto the path of enlightenment. Just as Mipar Rinpoche once said in the teaching on the King's Codes, he said that it doesn't matter how much you enjoy, uh, how much you enjoy happiness and how much you suffer. The wise ones would contemplate and would progress from such. But the fools, doesn't matter how much they've encountered happiness, how much they've had happiness and suffering, they would not gain any benefit from such experience. This is one of my favorite uh, teaching from Mipa Rinpoche. Happiness and wealth and fame, in fact, doesn't um, doesn't uh, really distract the uh, practice uh, realizations. Then this is certain kind of uh, certain kind of uh, uh, progress or benefit a practitioner can gain. And uh, whatever suffering happens, such as sickness or uh, or families dying, fa families death. Um, can also become a favorable condition for those practitioners. 
I think that's something that we need to memorize. This is one of the reasons I want to give the teaching on transforming suffering and happiness into enlightenment, because to the wise ones, to pr good practitioners, I think this is really useful. And to the um, not so wise ones, the ones who is not very good at practicing, whatever things happens in life, other than losing their virtue uh, and integrity, there's really no benefit for them. And there's no other functions of uh, such kind of events that happens in their life. So those are the reasons of giving this teaching. In the following, in terms of the outline, uh, the first one we're going to talk about is how to transform suffering into the path of enlightenment, which also has two aspects, which is uh, ultimate and uh, um, relative. The relative, uh, he talked quite a bit, but the ultimate is very easily put. Uh, it is said that according to the Madhyamika, it is a free from four extremes and eight elaborations. Uh, so there is no name of suffering at all. How can you say that there is a suffering, there is a feeling of suffering? And that teaching in the ultimate way is very easily taught, uh, is putting into very short wordings. But for lots of mundane beings who had never studied Madhyamika, who just started learning the Dharma, I think they really need this teaching. I really wanted to give this teaching to a large crowd. But because of impermanence, I really give to a very small group of people, only a few, and all of the the audience, the few audience that I have, are masked, uh, the few masketeers. In the 30 years of my teaching, in fact, this is the smallest number who are listening to my classes right now, and uh, you are listening to the, such a great teaching. I think I myself need to learn to transform this situation onto the path of enlightenment as well. So first of all, <coughs> how to use suffering as the path uh, to enlightenment through the relative truth? Whenever we're harmed by sentient beings or anything else, if we make a habit out of perceiving only the suffering, if we keep thinking that oh, it's so much suffering and so painful, then when even the smallest problem comes up, whatever smallest uh, external or um, whatever smallest problem that occurs in the external phenomena would cause enormous anguish in our mind. This is because of the nature of any perception or idea, uh, be it happiness or sorrow, is to grow stronger and stronger the more we become accustomed to it. I think today this is where we're going to uh, uh, where we're going to talk about. I really hope that you could memorize it because uh, this is really important teaching. Instead of crying when you in, when you encounter suffering, if you can remember this teaching, it would give you so much more help rather than just crying out loud. Not only you should recite it, you should then practice again and again, familiarize yourself in terms of a content and use it in your life. That is crucial. Whenever we encounter um, different harms from sentient beings and non sentient or which means the external phenomena, we should know that a majority of the time if we are if we get unhappy unhappy it is because of other sentient beings. So for example, your friend lies to you, betrayed you, your enemy harms you, slanders you and uh, create different obstacles. Even if not people, it could be animals and could be rats running around in your house, uh, rodents, and then, then you probably would feel really upset about it. Uh, or little insects, bugs, and um, different 
um, different kinds of things, uh, different kinds of animals. For people without good practice, um, before before the sunrise, little little sparrows would keep uh, chirping outside of my little house. If I'm not a good practitioner, I would probably feel really irritated and uh, feel that why don't you let me have a good sleep? Or the barking of dogs at night, things like that. We encounter those kind of things all the time. And sometimes we can't perceive uh, those kinds of uh, difficulties, and people would feel that, oh, there's some spirits and ghosts that's harming me, that's creating difficulties for me. Those are the categories of um, uh, harms that caused by sentient beings. And from a different aspect, you could encounter harm from external phenomena, um, the overall situation, for example, earthquake, flooding, all of those elements of earth, water, fire, and wind. From a personal situation, it could be small things that happen to you, or small things in your life, such as your staircase, such as um, your business, or your uh, or your uh, inner elements of of earth, water, fire, and wind, uh, or the external uh, material. The ones doesn't have any life. It can become a source of irritation as well. Your headphone, your your cell phone just wouldn't turn on, and those could all become a sense of irritation. And whenever you encounter this kind of situation, if you habitually think that, oh, this is so irritating, it's so annoying, it's so upsetting, it's so much, so painful, and so desperate, and so depressed. If you kept on saying all those negative words like this, and very little of those positive words, then all of your negative emotions under such kind of mentality, you would continuously to say those painful words. Because your mind is suffering, then, um, then you would train yourself to accustom to such kind of habit. You would continuously to look at the negative aspect. Um, it's so cold, it's so hot, it's so, the, the seat is so short, the, the throne is so short, and the house is so tall, this person is so, and so on. Majority of the time, if you're doing that, you would probably have a difficult time to look at yourself and say that I, I do that. Um, we would actually think that our way of thinking is very normal. In fact, it is already considered as a um, sense of um, mental disorder. Lots of Western psychologists uh, discover that there are different kinds of uh, mental disorders. And lots of the mental disorders uh, those Western psychologists are naming, in fact, are already stated in Buddhism uh, from 2,500 years ago. Um, it is only that the terms are used differently, such as uh, wrong view, deluded mind, and so on. And then the modern psychology thinks that they discovered it or they already understood. And even worse, some of them uh, would use the teachings in in religions, uh, in the teachings of ancient wisdom, and then give it a different name and uh, claim that it's their own finding. In Buddhism, we talk about that suffering comes from our mind instead of any of the, even the tiniest cause that could come from outside. We, we would consider those are only the conditions. 
But majority of worldly people would consider that this suffering comes from external world. If you only think that it is the external phenomenon, it is the、uh, anybody else that is contributing to your happiness or suffering, that you won't gain any happiness at all. However, if you are good at、um, Taming your own mind, you will be able to have more happiness. If you look at the external phenomena, any little bit of suffering could eventually、um, snowballing into a gigantic suffering. In fact, happiness and suffering. Are all grasping? If you continuously to accustom to it, it will、uh, increase. For example, if you train yourself to feel that I'm really happy, everything's great. It's raining outside. I'm really happy. It's not raining. That's great. It's great to see you. It's wonderful not to see you as well. Today I'm very full and I'm really happy about it. Today I'm I didn't、um, I didn't eat enough and I'm not full. I'm still a little bit hungry, but that's okay. I'm losing weight and I'm I'm happy about that. I can be happy to sit in the shrine hall to listen to the class. And see lots of practitioners. If I can't, then I can practice、um, impermanence, and that's really wonderful too. In the Mahaparinibbana Sutra, in fact, it says that if you suffer, if you、uh, suffer from anxiety, then such kind of、uh, suffering and anxiety would continuously to grow. And if we, just like when. Just like、uh, there are people who enjoy sleeping, and the more they sleep, the more they will sleep. Just、uh, such kind of um, um, such kind of.、Uh, Such kind of pattern also、uh, uh, are also apply applicable to、uh, drinking and、uh, so on. There are people who like sleeping. The more they sleep, the more they're accustomed to sleeping. In fact, this is really a habitual pattern. I myself, I don't really sleep a lot. Um, however, when I just came back, I didn't really have class to teach. I didn't really、uh, haven't really started translating, so、um, I only attended some morning、uh, meetings. But that doesn't have to be so early either. So I spent a lot of time sleeping. At the beginning, I couldn't really sleep, but eventually I accustomed to sleep longer as well. So we can see that it is very easy to change our habits. Um, same as suffering. If you think about suffering more, then that kind of suffering will continue to grow.、Um, if you continue to think in such a way, then this kind of external conditions will con、uh, will contribute to your suffering. I think many people definitely have lots of this kind of mental disorder. Uh, in the West, lots of the, the psychiatrists and、uh, psychologists.、Uh, Would be consulted if people、uh, feel that there is something wrong with their、uh, with their thinking or with their mind, but that kind of. But in in Tibet it is quite rare.、Uh, in mainland area, I think、uh, domestically in Tibet is rare, and in mainland area, I think lots of people really shy away from such kind of consultation. They don't really want to say that I have mental disorder.、Uh, let's talk about OCD, the obsessive compulsive disorder. Some of them would have obsessive compulsive disorder in terms of.、Um, uh, Their actions, but this is very much based in their mentality. For example, they would feel that their window and door is open, and then they have to double check and triple check. They can't even, they can't barely sleep. They have to go back and check again. And there are people who had to wash their hands again and again and again. The, the hands,、uh, maybe their skin has already got rashes from washing. 
washing, but then they can't stop themselves but compulsively like, washing their hands again and again. Uh, there are people who have the OCD towards、uh, arranging things, and all the little things has to go back to the original order or wherever they placed it. They have to have the things according to their habitual ways. There are people who would feel that there are so many hair and, and dust and、uh, so dirty from outside. So people,、uh, and that kind of people, would continuously to wash and wanting to clean their their clothing again and again. Well, in the phenomenal world, there are external conditions. A little bit of those conditions are contributed from the external、uh, phenomena world. However, the majority reason is because the mind has some disorder. The modern psychologists also、uh, agree in such a way. According to Buddhist practitioners, it is because the mind is in disorder, which is related to the previous karma as well as、uh, the、um, the education and and、uh, the the living situation. This is considered as one of the disorders that it, everything has to be done according to、uh, the 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 person that person's way the the one whosoever got OCD. Another disorder is、uh, persecutory delusion. They feel that other people is trying to hurt or harm them. At all times, for example, if I give teachings today, and、uh, there are people who think that Kempel doesn't like me, the way Kempel looked at me is not normal. He stared at me. He、um, rolled his eyes at me. He must want to hurt hurt me or harm me. Or they would probably imagine、uh, there are some ghosts or spirits want to harm them, or imagine there are some fellow practitioners want to harm them. That is this kind of delusion that that、um, uh, a person could continuously to habituate to themselves with. I've heard that there are people who、um, who to say that you said so and so because you wanted to scold me in this class. It's because you don't like me. It's because so and so. Especially when I give teachings,、uh, when I give the practice teachings from the Kadampa tradition, because it's so sharp. There are people who to say that you're saying this. To、um, to pointing fingers at me, but that's not true. Majority of the time, it's really a persecutory delusion. It's not a fact. That is also because one has not really、um, tamed their mind. Their mind is very anxious. Their mind is rather quite fragile. In in the Bodhisattva Charyavatara, it is said that it is better not to be too、uh, fragile. If you are weak and fragile, it would contribute to suffering. Because if you're weak and fragile, you are then more prone to feel suffering. Another condition. I think I once read that there are people who would control others. Based on the name of love, for example, if I am a mother, I love my child very, very much, and she would think that because I love my child, I have to control my child. 
Did you eat yet? Have you eaten yet? You should eat more. You should eat less. Did you wash your hand yet?、Uh, turn off your light. Even if the child has already turned 40 or 50 years old, the mother would continue、uh, would still think that. Um, the child should listen to her way of thinking. The child is no longer one or two. Why are you micromanaging? There are times when I need to cross the road.、Uh, some fellow practitioners, whomsoever, stand beside me. They would say that, "Oh, watch out! There's a car. There's a red light." And I would think to myself, "I'm not that stupid, am I?" I mean, there's some smart yaks and goats. They would know how to cross the road as well. They know how to watch. But maybe because those are the habits from others,、um, because of care and love, they would do so. They would macro manage. This is in fact also、um, a disorder or a, a, a wrong way of training your mind. So this kind of controlling mind to the parents, the spouse, the、um, pal- uh, parents and children、uh, relations, in fact. Could also be very suffocating, and the majority of time, people who have such kind of deluded mind don't really know, and they would consider their deluded, deluded way and deluded way of thinking is the correct way, is a very normal action. So,、uh, from the Bigger picture, I think majority of the sentient beings are ignorant, and sentient beings all have this ignorant and delusion, de- delusional mind. And nowadays, I have to say, it is getting more and more severe. Why is that? It is because the media and the value that it's promoting brings promotes the. The idea of the more you grasp, the more perfect, and then you will be able to have happiness. So, from this kind of delusional guidance from media, majority of people won't be able to attain genuine happiness. Without genuine happiness, mind cannot be tamed, and without、uh, the ability of taming your mind, people could lose their courage to live in this world. That is why、uh, there is a hike of the suicidal rate global wide. There is the suicidal, the the number of suicides、um, annually nowadays has reached over a million. People would go to.、Um, In countries such as Japan and China, is much higher.、Uh, on an average, there is、uh, one suicide per 40 seconds. So some of the Western、uh, statesmen would say that, well, the pandemic is not the most severe. In fact, there is more. Um, suicidal cases than pandemic death. And in some ways, they're right. Not only they would choose suicide, they would choose a really beautiful places such as Fuji Mountain and, and the Great Bridge of、uh, Los Angeles and so on. Um, this year, the,、uh, recently, I read that there was one student who cheated during exam, and then the teacher. Took over that student's、um, test、uh, and the cell phone, the exam, the exam paper and cell phone, without doing anything、um, extra. But the student committed suicide after being silent for 20 minutes. At first, people would think that the teacher probably did something、uh, harmful, but after watching the、uh, after the watching the recording,、um, people realized that, that the teacher didn't do anything. It is because the person doesn't have any courage to face it and doesn't have any. Capacity of transform that onto the path, and then that's why they would choose to commit suicide. So, whenever I look at the practitioners, 
I think there were probably people who would have considered suicide, commit suicide. Uh, and uh, in fact, there are Buddhists. If they're not good practitioner practitioners, uh, they would have they would probably consider uh, committing suicide. Because there are people who look like ordained, but they are their mind is not. But that is a, a very small number of uh, people, a very minority. So this is really the teaching of the mind. If you don't really know this mind and think this is normal, this is not a mental disorder, and do not accept the fact that uh, your mind is deluded or is uh, rather uh, in disorder, then any little thing, any little attitude, little feedback could hurt you and could be the cause to contribute to um, choosing severe ways of ending your life. So I really think Buddhism has lots of peace instruction to give to, uh, to tame this mind. The author Tempe Nima, in fact, uh, lived in the time that is um, very recent, less than 100 years. And at that time, there were no high technologies in such a rural area where he lived. But because he studied the Mahayana teachings, uh, his understanding of modern people's mentality is very thorough. And if you could understand this, you would be able to understand the mind. Just as in the Bodhicharya Vatara, it says that for those who wish to find happiness and avoid suffering, will wonder without uh, wonder without meaning or purpose if they do not practice uh, training this mind, the supreme and principal Dharma. If you could really understand this, you would be able to realize that whatever happens in your life, in the external uh, phenomena, uh, in anything uh, external is really contributing condition, and it's, it's really small. It, it really contributes a very little. So let it be OCD, let it be persecutory delusion. Um, if you understand the supreme secrets of the mind, then nothing could harm you. So the best way of working with it is to understand our wrong view and wrong thoughts that brings negativity. After understanding it, you will be able to see, and you will probably feel that this is how you used to face those things are quite laughable. And you will be able to see that you can embrace everything with a much bigger heart and mind. And this is positive thinking. Of course, there's negative thinking as well, and uh, uh, psychologists would think that um, a positive thinking is whatever you face, whatever you perceive, you would take it in positively uh, or towards a positive uh, direction. And nothing's that severe, nothing's, nothing matters that much. But negative thinking is that your, your thoughts is always around it's sturdy, there's a bug, this cup is not good for my health, uh, the world is about to harm me, I have to get rid of this and that because it's not good for my health and this world is so dirty and so dark and so on it's very negative or you could think that all my fellow practitioners are the manifestation of bodhisattvas and buddhas this is really great this is uh, the the kind of positive thinking with faith with devotion this is a kind of practice a kind of habituating yourself with with the right practice 
，如果母亲有正在这个发嗔恨心的时候，最好不要给孩子这个喂奶，不然的话，那就是孩子就是身上马上有病。I've never really, um, well, I, I, I heard this, but then I never really、uh, went through this kind of education. But nowadays, it is said that scientists would encourage mothers not to milk, uh, not to breastfeed their children when they're being angry, because、uh, such kind of breast milk would be poisonous for. The children. We often say the poison of five afflictions. What is the poison?、Uh, the poison of anger. When such kind of、um, uh, when the blood of when the blood of poisonous of anger is、uh, transferred to a lab rat, the lab rat would die. And if a person is suffering from excessive desire, which is negative emotion,、uh, is very also is also very harmful to the health of a person. Similarly, ignorance is also、um, a poison. So people don't understand. It is only that people don't understand that they're suffering from it. It is because they don't have the right value system. Is that they、uh, they are suffering still in the samsara? Therefore, I really hope that people could understand the secret of the mind. One is ultimate secret; the other one is relative secret. What is the rel the relative secret of the mind? Are there happiness and suffering? Yes, in our relative world. But mundane being, then mentally increase the、uh, the, the suffering in their mind that does not exist in this relative world. It is then nominal increment, such as. Such as if、uh, there's burning on their body, this is、uh, this is the actual thing that's happening. But if there's no burning on your body, but there's a burning in your mind, then this is the nominal increment. It never it's it's not there, but you think it is.、Um, The suffering of external world can be understood. You cannot accept it,、uh, and because you cannot accept it, it becomes an even bigger pain to you. So once we accustom to the thoughts, the thinking of happiness and suffering, it will、uh, increase.、Uh, once we accustom to happiness or suffering, it will increase. That's just the natural.、Uh, that's just uh, uh, the nature. Therefore, we need to er eradicate such kind of、uh, suffering. We need to understand it is a cause and condition. Also, in our life, let doesn't matter whatever happens. Do not grasp grasp to it. You should have a sense of go with the flow. For example, maybe today you can come to the shrine hall and.、Uh, Um, at the door, you're told that you can't come in to listen to the class. You can say, "Okay," and then you can sing and skipping and、uh, singing a Doha song and uh, um, think that、uh, everything is great. It's all happiness, and go back.、Uh, Shanti Deva said that if、uh, you are enduring sickness, then sickness can be happy because you are really.、Um, Because you are enduring the、um, the negative karmas from previous life,、uh, and if you're not、uh, if you're not ill, then healthy is also happy because healthy body can be beneficial to practice. I think we need to learn how to go with the flow. We shouldn't force everything to happen in our way. We can be happy in,、uh, we can be happy and content in any situation. 
This mind of contentment is also very important. Another way is that we have to learn how to look at things from different angles. Even if you did not get what you wanted, but maybe that's the best for you. And if you can accustom yourself to this kind of thinking, it could be very beneficial to your practice. In my whole life, I went through a lot of things, many things: sickness, surgery, death of my parents, and many more. And I don't think it's because of、um, I'm enlightened or anything, but probably. Probably because I familiarize myself more with this kind of teachings.、Um, I meet all different kinds of people. I encounter different harms from sentient beings and from the external world. But I understand that, and I can accept it. And I would look from a different angle for a different beneficial factor or contributing or or. or、uh, Uh, any contributing favorable conditions, for example, during during the pandemic, I spent all my time and translated a lot. And during that period of time, I was very happy. Maybe you don't really believe it, but that's the fact. So whatever you encounter, if Uh, whatever you encounter, if you encounter suffering, instead of stubbornly, continuously to force the way that you want to get, why don't you switch your man- mindset and just turn back and sing the Doha song and whatever, hap-、uh, whatever happens, happens and.、Uh, um, It is because、uh, happiness or or suffering. The more you think of it, the more it will grow. Well, I have too much to talk about, but、uh, our time is up, so we'll stop here. This is a natural.、Uh, this is natural law. We'll stop here. Thank、you